Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship here at Braddock Street Church, where we strive to be followers of Jesus, loving God in worship, loving others in small groups, and serving the world in mission. My name is Annalise, and I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street. You may notice I'm up here by myself this week. That is because Kirk is on vacation. He's doing great, as far as I can tell, and we pray many traveling mercies for him on his way home in a few days. We would love for you to know that if you have a prayer request this morning, that there are blue cards in the pew rack in front of you that you can fill out during our first hymn. Our ushers will come by and pick those up so that we can pray over them a little later in our service. And if you are new to us this morning, there's a green card in the pew rack in front of you. Fill that out and leave it for us on the offering plate so that we can get to know you a little bit better. We also want to say good morning to everybody who's with us online. We're so glad you all are here. And if you have a prayer request this morning, then you can leave them right there in the Facebook comments. Um, And you can also like and comment and share. Let us know that you are with us so that we can get to know you a little better. And if you have um, a prayer request, like I said, you can drop it right there in in the comments. And also there is a digital sign-in card for you to fill out there as well. I'm going to ask you all to stand as you are able and join with me in our call to worship. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. Happy is the mortal who does this, the one who holds the fast and keeps the Sabbath. Do not let the foreigner joined to the Lord say, for the Lord will surely separate me from his people. The foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, I will bring to my holy mountain. My house shall be a house of prayer for all people. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel. Please join in our opening prayer. Holy God, you have declared through your prophets and through your son that your house is a house of prayer for all people as we enter your house today may we accept your welcome and extend it to all others amen i invite you to remain standing as you are able and join with us in our opening hymn number 168 at the name of jesus every knee will bow
Good morning. My name is Bob Brock. The scripture reading this morning is from Mark 11, 12 through 18. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, and his disciples heard it. Then they came into Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, it is not written, or is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teachings. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is important to us here at Braddock Street that you all know what kind of wonderful things we are able to do because of your generosity. So we want to raise up for you today some folks that are really important to us, the Adult Day Care Center. The work that they do ensures that adults that need extra care have a safe place to be during the day, and that is such a blessing and is not a thing that every community has the ability to have available to them. So we're thankful for the amazing work that these folks do and thankful to you all for allowing us to support them so well. So we will invite our ushers to come forward as we receive this morning's offering and hear together this offertory.
Let us pray. Holy God, we give with joy into your kingdom today and ask that you would bless these gifts and us to your service. Amen. You may be seated. Again, good morning. My name is Annalise, and I'm one of the pastors here, but not the only one. Pastor Kirk is away on vacation. And today we are starting a new sermon series that is called Jesus Is, where we will be talking about different aspects of who Jesus is, and we're going to start off by talking about the humanity of Jesus. Would you all please pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I read a great proverb recently online, and it crossed my virtual dashboard in the form of a cartoon, which includes one of the world's cutest animals, a raccoon. Here it is. When you feel like everyone hates you, sleep. When you feel like you hate everyone, eat. And when you feel like you hate yourself, shower. It's good advice, right? Like, it makes a lot of sense. And one of the first things that came to mind when I saw it is that someone should remake this cartoon with Jesus instead of a raccoon. So if there are any artists out there who want to, like, remake this for me, I would love that. Jesus starts off his ministry with a shower of sorts. He is baptized by his cousin John and in that moment takes on his mission in a new way, having embraced himself as God's son. Jesus also has a habit of resting when he needs it, and even if it's inconvenient to other people, like, you know, on a boat in the middle of a storm. And according to the book of Mark, Jesus attempted, at least, to eat something when he was feeling pretty mad at the world. And he was so hangry, hungry plus angry, right? He was so hangry that he cursed a poor innocent fig tree that had never done anything wrong in its entire life. Let me explain. The day before this story that we heard read for us today, Jesus has entered Jerusalem on a donkey, triumphantly, you know the story, most of you, right, that he is coming in and people are cheering and they're throwing down their coats, they're cutting branches off the trees and laying them in the road so that he can walk down on top of them. And those same people who are doing all of this celebrating, all of this praising, they're going to betray him in less than a week, and he already knows this. So after a day of bittersweet celebration, where he's the only one who's fully grasping the seriousness of the moment, he finds himself with his pack of dudes, none of whom understand what is about to go down, and he's hungry, and he's frustrated, and he sees a fig tree in the distance, and it, he sees that it has leaves on it, and so he thinks, okay, maybe it's also got fruit on it, even though it's not fig season, it's got leaves, so maybe it's produced some fruit. So he goes up to inspect it, and there is not a fig in sight. And in this moment, his anger starts to boil over, and he does something that is equal parts very human and very divine. This is very human because I mean, seriously, who among us has not experienced that awful feeling of being anxious, angry, and having an empty stomach at the same time, right? Anybody else know what that feels like? Thank you. And so this is a recipe for cursing that is as old as humanity itself. And this moment is also super godlike because while most of us may have had the experience of wanting to curse an inanimate object for not doing what we want it to in a moment of hunger fuel. Those curses usually don't work, but this one does because, you know, Jesus is also God. And that's the tricky thing about this sermon topic is that you can't actually separate out Jesus's humanity from Jesus's divinity. Even though exactly how it all splits out, or if it even really does, has been a source of contention for a long time. Is this guy just a guy who happens to be a really great prophet and an even better human? Is he literally the son of God? Yes, and also yes, because both, but also more than those things. 
The earliest theologians started trying to parse this whole thing out, which led to many church councils and several creeds, including the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, and it also led to fights, both metaphorical and physical. There's one story that's been passed down through the years that has maybe some shaky evidence. It might not have actually happened, but it's still the most ridiculous of stories, and so we love to tell it, and that story involves St. Nicholas. Yes, that St. Nicholas, the one that you are thinking of, and it involves him punching a dude in the face. Thank you. I got like a couple of like titters out there, but here's the thing. I have told this story three times now, and no one else seems to think it's super weird that Santa Claus punched somebody in the face. Is that just me? Like, (laughs) all right. But so the guy in question who was going to have his face punched um, is a guy named Arius. And the deal with Arius is that he believes that Jesus is just a guy. Like he's like, yeah, he's like a human dude who did some cool stuff but he's not like the actual son of God. That doesn't make any sense. And St. Nicholas to that says, I don't think so. Okay, and uh, you know, maybe not the nicest quite way that he could have said so. But I'm gonna have to save all the details of that for a different sermon, okay? When all of the dust had settled and certain saints and heretics had recovered from injuries that they allegedly received, the church decided that Jesus was in fact 100% and 100% God, and those who disagreed with that were asked with varying levels of politeness to leave. So the fully divine and fully human Jesus was angry enough to curse a poor innocent tree. What is up with that? Well, then here's another thing that's really important to know about this story. This isn't actually about figs. It's really not. As soon as the fig tree was left behind to wither, Jesus and the squad head to the temple in Jerusalem, and there they find a completely ordinary scene. There are a lot of people doing business here. Some folks are changing money. Others are buying doves and other poor unfortunate animals who are going to be used as sacrifices inside the temple. Others of them are coming to settle debts. Some are here to sign contracts. Some are folks that are here to bring precious objects to be kept safe in the temple. And some people are bringing those valuable objects in as collateral. The temple's going to hold it as a neutral space while both parties do whatever they're supposed to do by their contract or whatever, and then can come back and retrieve those things. And all of these services were offered to the community with a price. This was expected at synagogues at the time. Not only were they places of worship, but they were also marketplaces and banks and centers of commerce. Things had not always been this way because this happened mostly because of the Jewish diaspora, that is the scattering of the people due to famines, due to political upheavals, human migration, and the fact that their land keeps getting conquered by other people over and over again, including, you know, in this exact moment that we're talking about. The Jewish people are under Roman rule still at this time. And so they needed a place that was safe, where they can gather as a community, where they can do business, and that place became the temple. But that wasn't really what the temple was designed to be. God wanted the temple to be a place where people were welcome to come and worship. Nothing else was really supposed to be happening there. It was a place that was meant to bring people closer to each other and to God. But instead, it became a place where people were kind of just making a whole lot of money. And it was definitely not supposed to be a place that excluded anyone but it did become a really insular community. And so what were we supposed to do about all of this? Well, Jesus' answer is to turn over some tables, which is what he does. He gives a quick lecture during that time as well where he calls them robbers and reminds them that the purpose of the temple is to be a house of prayer for all people. Then the next day, the disciples have to be walking back past that poor tree. Remember the fig tree? Yeah, he's still here, except he's not. He's actually very dead and has withered all the way down to his roots. And all of the disciples see this, and they're like, ooh, that's not good. And Jesus stops to have a conversation with them and says, okay, so here's the thing. We need to have a little chat about faith and about what is about to happen. The disciples being the disciples, it still goes over their heads, but you know. So why is there a story about Jesus 
ransacking a temple in the middle of a completely different story about Jesus cursing a fig tree. Because these two stories are connected. The author of Mark especially really likes to do this, where they interrupt themselves while they're telling a story with another story because the two are connected, and the hope is that if you read them kind of mixed together like this, that you'll understand the point a little bit better. And so the fig tree wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. It had made leaves, but no fruit. And the temple wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. It had made people a whole bunch of money, but it had not brought them closer to each other or to God. So the fig story isn't really about figs. It's actually about producing, or in this case, not producing, good fruit. Jesus makes it clear that he's unhappy with what is happening in this situation, especially this in the temple, which is a reminder that the next time that someone says, what would Jesus do to you, that you have every right to say, flip over some tables, because that is a valid option. Cool? Now, Jesus, in this moment when he is in the temple, decides to quote from two different prophets. From Isaiah, he takes the comments about the temple being the house of prayer for all people. For Isaiah, all means all, including those who had previously been excluded. And here is an example. This is from Isaiah 56, verses 6 to 8. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. And then from Jeremiah, Jesus gets the line about the people being robbers. Like, he calls them robbers because Jeremiah does the same thing earlier. Jeremiah's whole thing is that evil influences have come into the leadership, and they have taken over, and they're claiming to do things in God's name, but none of these things are good things. And they're also claiming that they're still being guided and protected by God, even though all they have done is broken the covenant consistently. Here's how Jeremiah says it. Chapter 7, verses 8 through 11. Here you are, trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known? And then come and stand here before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are safe only to go on doing all these abominations, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? I too am watching, says the Lord. It isn't a coincidence that Jesus chooses these two prophets to quote, at least not in my opinion. Isaiah is a prophet who mixes hope with his terrifying visions of the future. He essentially says, you've messed up, bad things are coming, but things will come to. Jeremiah, on the other hand, comes out of his trance-like states every once in a while just to, you know, rail at God about making him the messenger of all of this bad news. Jesus deeply understands these men. Not only does he feel the impending doom, remember we are less than a week from Jesus's crucifixion at this point, but he also knows that it will all be worth it because the suffering that he is about to go through is going to give everyone a chance a different kind of life. So he's a lot like Isaiah because there's hope in the midst of his fear and sadness. And he's also a lot like Jeremiah because he's overwhelmingly uncomfortable with being made to be the one that is the sacrifice but also accepts that this is his responsibility. He also agrees with both of their messages. God's house should be open to all people, and bad leaders are still claiming the name of God while leading people in the opposite direction in order to gain power and money. These aren't the only ill-fated prophets that Jesus has a lot in common with. 
This story also reminds me of a modern day prophet, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And yes, I know it's super cliche to talk about MLK in a sermon, but I'm doing it anyway, so go with me on this. At the end of our reading for today, we hear that the powerful people who are running all of these money-making operations in the temple are not happy with Jesus. Some of them haven't been happy with Jesus for a long time, but they kind of reach a new fervor about how much they don't like Jesus because to them, he's starting to step outside of his lane. Because it's one thing to talk about peace, it's another thing to heal people, and even to, you know, claim to be the son of God or whatever he's doing, right? But don't start messing with people's money. And that's exactly what he was doing. And a lot of people didn't like MLK for very similar reasons. I mean, they started off not liking him because he was very inconveniently telling them not to be racist anymore, which, you know, is never a fun thing to get told. I do understand that, but it needed to be said then. Sometimes it still needs to be said now, but we'll talk about that a different day. But MLK is standing here in the same exact position, right? He starts stepping outside of his lane. He starts talking about war and how terrible and useless it is. He starts talking about poverty, and he starts saying that the systems that are holding up war and poverty need to be completely dismantled. In other words, he starts messing with people's money, and that is the final nail in his coffin. Has anyone else here ever listened to This American Life? We do a lot of podcast listening in our group of friends and in our family, right? And so there was a story that happened, and it was on This American Life like years ago. I don't know if anyone else remembers it, but it stuck with me for a long time. It was about a little girl, and it's Martin Luther King Jr. Day, so she's off of school, and her dad decides, let's go to the MLK Museum so you can learn why you're not going to school today, right? And she's about halfway through the museum, has not, you know, gotten to the point where they know exactly what is going to happen to MLK. And she turns to her dad and says, they're going to kill him just like they killed Jesus, aren't they? Amazing that this kid who understands what's going on here, right, they get it. They understand why these two things are so similar. So what's our takeaway for all of this? Jesus cursed a fig tree and ran everybody out for exploiting the temple for their own gain. And he declared that God's house is a place of prayer for all people, a place that excludes no one, a place that is not meant for, to be used for personal gain, but for fellowship and to honor and glorify God. And we're called to stand by those same principles. We're called to pay attention and to ask questions about our church community. We're called to make this place, a church for all people, and to make sure that it never becomes exclusive or a place that people can exploit for personal gain. So what does that look like? I think it looks like diversity. I think it looks like we have to, us getting outside of our own comfort zone, walking into communities that we would normally not spend time in, intentionally making relationships with people just because God loves them just because we love them and because we want to share God's love with them, not so that we can bring them in and change them, but so that our community can change because of them being in it, so that we can get closer to reflecting what it looks like to be the kingdom of God because more people are present teaching us about who God is just by being there. We also have to keep our own church accountable, hold our own church leadership accountable to make sure that we are spending our money on things that make sense to spend money on. We have to be careful not to fall into the trap of spending a bunch of money to make Braddock Street look really cool and shiny and new when we could be working just to like keep it functional and pleasant and then spending our money on things that in my opinion are more important than that, like assisting our neighbors that are in need all around us. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of work that we have to do on this building, but to be fair, I'm one of those millennial pastors who's like, burn the whole building down, let's start over. I don't want to deal with a building because that's who I am, but there is a whole lot of work to do if we are going to keep a building and keep it going, and that means that we have to put in a lot of work and a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort into getting those things fixed, including this thing, (laughs) which if you've never watched them bring the cherry picker in here to change the light bulbs, it is a whole event, and it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort to fix it, and light bulbs go out on it every single day. It is a pain, and we're going to have to deal with it. 
but that doesn't mean that it needs to be our only or our greatest priority because it does not matter if we have fancy signs or actual working lights or perfect signage or anything like that if everything that's happening inside of our building is just a dying community. It doesn't make sense. Why would we do that? So if you want to be a part of growing this place, not so that we can be the biggest or the coolest church around, not so that we can compete with our fancier, wealthier neighbors, not so that we can, you know, be as cool as the other kids on the block, but so that we can truly love our neighbors, so that we can show God's love to our neighbors and invite them into a community that is going to welcome them happily and in a way that is so excited to embrace them and to learn more about who God is because they're there. If you want to do that with us, let me know because there's so many things that we are working on right now, so many great ideas and things that are moving forward because there is a passion, a real fire moving through this community for making sure that this is exactly a house of prayer for all people. Hopefully, while we're in that process, we're not going to need to turn over any tables or curse any fig trees, but I'm going to be honest with you, I super can't promise that. Would you all please pray with me? Holy God, you have declared through your prophets and through your Son that this place is a house of prayer for all people. Guide us in new ways of making it so. Grant us opportunities to meet people outside of our comfort zone and the courage to take those opportunities as they come. Keep us ever watchful of our motives. Ensure that our goal is sharing your love and nothing else. May we feel the fire of Jeremiah, the hope of Isaiah, and when necessary, the anger of Jesus. And may we turn those feelings into actions that expand your kingdom. God, we know that there are many people in need of your love and care in a special way today. And so we raise up to you, Harold Ogg and Lucinda Angel, Kay Umps, Curtis Thwing and his family, Suzanne French, Inez Roadcap, Catherine Baber, Liz Eppinger, the Caparts, the family of Leon Jennings, Melissa Schatzer, Marie Snow, John Lobb, Heidi Lucas, Jean Fischel, Mike Rogers, Crystal Wright, Gwen Hargrove, Michelle Cohen, Diana Hill, and all of those that we hold now silently in our hearts. Holy God, on a weekend where we think about the history of our nation, we ask that you would bring justice. God, we ask that you would help us as we reflect upon who we are to move towards being a nation full of people that love justice. God, we also ask that you would be in all of the places where your violence, well, where violence is reigning and ask that instead your peace would be there. God, we ask that you would be in Ukraine that you would be in all places that are dealing with gun violence. And God, we ask that you would help us to find better solutions to all of these problems than war. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we come to the Lord's table today, it is important to remember that this table does not belong to me. It doesn't belong to Braddock Street. This table belongs to God, and that means that absolutely everyone is welcome here. You do not need to be a member of this church. You don't even need to be a baptized Christian. The only thing that you need to come to this table is a desire to receive God's grace and a contrite heart. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. 
Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's take a moment of silent prayer and confession. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with one another, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would like to invite our servers to come forward, and also please know, servers, that our hand sanitizer is on the tables down here, so clean your hands on your way up.
for us. Some instructions for folks, um, if you have not done communion with us before, there will be three stations across the front here. If you are sitting all the way to my left, you're going to walk this way to this aisle and come to your servers right here. Middle section is going to go all the way across and come up and meet me in the middle right here. And this section over here is going to come by the outside aisle, return by this aisle over here, and your servers will be here. There's also gluten-free elements here if you, would like, if you need them. And so if you would uh, like to come up, we hope that you will and receive communion because, again, this table is open to everyone. You'll receive a piece of bread and a small cup with some juice in it. After you've received those, you may leave the cups for us right in the gold trays that are on the tables.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves to others. We love you. Amen. I invite you all to stand as you are able and join us in our closing song, number 437, This Is My Song. It has been a joy to be in worship with you all today. Thank you for being here, and thanks for putting up with me because, you know, Kirk isn't here, and I got to try it out on my own. So thank you for your support. I had so many people encourage me this morning, and it was wonderful. Thank you all very much. Um, a thing we want you to know going into the next month is that if you're one of those folks that, like, super, super loves and, like, cannot wait for the newsletter from church to show up, 
this is not going to be your month, I'm sorry, because we're giving Daya a break and she is not making a newsletter for the month of July. That does not mean that there is nothing to know, so do please keep an eye on your emails because we have a whole bunch of stuff that is coming up in August, including a block party that I am not kidding when I say is going to take every single person's help. We're going to need you all. We want to throw a big celebration for our whole community and invite everybody to come and get to know who we are, and we hope that you will help us out. So if you would like to be involved with that, let us know, and also don't look for the signups in the newsletter because it doesn't exist. Got it? Good? Wonderful. Thank you. You'll get one in August, but not in July. Hear now your benediction. Now go in peace to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. May those in this world to whom love is a stranger find in you most generous friends. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.